everybody, welcome back to Tim's Vinyl Confessions and welcome back to the latest edition of the Y&T Deep Dive Series. John, the music nut, joins me once again. Hey, John. Hi, Tim. How you doing? I'm doing good. We are in, we're, we're in um, waters that don't get treaded through or tread through enough, I don't think, because I, I think there's a lot of Y&T fans that were into the band and bought some of the albums, but I, I bet you there's a lot of fans up there that think they stopped after 10 in 1990 because they did they did go on hiatus after 10 but um mm -hmm. they were definitely not done i'm not sure the exact timeline john maybe you know a little bit about this i know that they played their two sort of farewell shows at the end of 1990 those were captured on yesterday and today live um and then they went on hiatus uh steph and jimmy joined alice cooper's band for a while dave built a studio i'm right. not sure what phil did but at a certain point um obviously they decided to give it a go again did do you know the timeline of that how that went or just as, about as much as about as much as you you do tim because by this point and i said this in the book once they broke up i was listening to other bands so i only knew about this album after it came out and i didn't buy it for many years after and it's a regret now that i didn't buy this in 95 because I was missing a fantastic hard rock album from that year. But yeah, at that point, I, I didn't know what was going on uh, other than what you said. I mean, I knew that um, Steph and Jimmy were with Alice Cooper. And I think I, I saw Alice Cooper in 96. So I'm thinking they were there at that point, you know, they were probably, they were with y and but y and wasn't torn much at that point. Right. Right. Like they didn't really start touring again until Jill, Dave's wife, Jill Manichetti, came to their manager and she was putting them out on the road, which yeah, it goes over in their wonderful documentary on with the show. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so that's as much so, as I would know about it. So my my timeline kind of goes um it was I think summer of ninety five. I bought Metal Edge religiously. Okay. Um, and in the news section. There was a very, very brief mention that Y&T had reunited and had an album out called Musically Incorrect. Now, that was really exciting, but at the same time, I couldn't find any other information about it. I couldn't find anywhere to get it. I didn't know what label it was on. I mean, it was like, okay. And, and normally, normally you could. There'd, there'd be order forms in the magazines. Where right. Said, like, so I, I kind of had to cool my heels um, for, the, for over a year. Um, there was a store that used to, that I used to order stuff from a lot um, in, in the States because it was just across the border because um, it was just stuff that I couldn't get in stores in Canada. I, you know, I, I'm all about, you know, shopping in Canada, but anyway, I'm going to get on that debate, but yeah, I, I used to make frequent trips to this store and, they had this, th this is, th this is like 95, 96. The internet was out, but yeah. I didn't have a computer and I didn't know any, you know, it was new. So uh, they had this next to the cash register. They had this little machine that kind of looked like an ATM. It was kind of that size. Okay. And you could look for albums and it would tell you if they were available for order. And if it was, you'd click and it would spit out this, receipt sort of thing you take it up the front counter and you either paid for the whole thing or you put a down payment on it a couple of weeks later you come back and check and you get your order i did that a lot and i would always check for yt because at that point uh i'm trying to think i still didn't have all of their albums on cd i had most of them but i didn't have okay. all of them on cd but i went and looked and they finally had a listing for musically incorrect and i'm like i couldn't get that printed out fast enough as a matter of fact two of my buddies with me we all three of us ordered it which was great nice and it came back again no idea what it looked like had no idea what i just i had to have it right sight unseen right and then i come back in a couple weeks uh ask for it yeah they passed over the camp here you go this and i'm like oh uh okay uh that's that's something <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh no logo very uh, nondescript sort of uh, album cover, but okay. And, um, you know, as soon as they look on the back, Bruce by Scott Bore, 
Damon and Keddie, Phil Cannamore, 1995, Mean Streak music, bass melting music. Yeah, okay, all right. One thing I did notice looking down through the song titles, like, I'm lost. Okay, that must be a, okay, must be a redo. Right. Anyway, pop it in the car. Just, and I say this in the book, pure electric guitar. It starts out with a pick slide, mm -hmm. and it's like, all oh, right. And then uh, it kicks in, and it's that, I think everybody does this when you like a band and, they, and then they have new music out after a while, you're excited, but you're nervous because what happens if you don't like it, you know? Right. And like, what does Dave sound like now? Dave sounds great. He's, you know, I kindly decline your invitation. He's, he's singing with menace, like nasty. And like, he's, these guys are mad. They're frustrated. Um, there's a lot of that on this album, but it's not, I've said this many times, this is not them going grunge, thank God for me. But uh, this is, they're very much sounding like Y&T, but they, they were not in a good frame of mind when they wrote a lot of this album. And it comes out, the venom comes out of this recording. It is the same band. It's still Dave and Phil and Steph and Jimmy. Uh, very bare bones production, but good. And lest anyone doubt Jimmy DeGrasso's ab uh, uh, abilities as a drummer, he is on fire on this album. Um, what do you think a long way down, the opener? Well, this is what happens when you let, when you don't have these contractual obligations and you don't have somebody in their ear and a manager saying, you gotta do this or do that. This is the band free doing what they want. I listen to this, I'm like, maybe... As far as recording this band, maybe the answer was looking in the mirror and maybe they should have did it themselves the whole time because I think this is their best sounding album. Scott Borey's their manager. He was their he was, manager. Yeah, he was their manager at the time. Yeah, yeah. He's their manager. Um, I hear a band here, a lot like what you say here, Tim. They had these things going in their mind. They listened to what was grunt what was going on with grunge and they took a little bit of this and they added it to a musical palette and they got even stronger here yeah. and this long way down wicked opener with all that guitar it's this mid-tempo stomp great lyrics deep lyrics they're pissed yeah but this rocks like hell excellent track what really again on this album you really hear the musicianship on here this this is steph jimmy phil and dave spectacular excellent track great riffs here they slow it down the bass phil's bass you probably never heard phil's bass like this ever i mean yeah. it was a monster on here the songs on here are great throughout the first five songs just kick your ass. This is killer how it slows down and it goes back into that main mid paced groove and then they speed it up. And when they're speeding up, they are firing on all cylinders. Dave's throwing in those ad libs. It's seven minutes long, but it takes about a minute and a half before they really get into that main theme. And then it just grabs you by the throat and doesn't let go. This is a scorcher of an opener. And the solos on here are sick. The all the little fills, Jimmy DeGrasso, Jesus, his fills are all over this album. Yeah, it's yeah. Pain. But quick little crashes, and yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, killer opener. So much venom and vigor on this track. I love it. Um, yeah, and it's it's interesting to know it, it is self produced pretty much. And when it says it's recorded at the space station. That's Dave's home studio. That was okay. what there he got go. to work on after Y&T disbanded. You know, he he jokes he almost threw his back out lugging in sheets of drywall to soundproof it. And um, and um, a lot of this is I don't know how much Steph is on this because a lot of this that when when Dave goes into a solo, um, th there's no rhythm guitar dropped in. A lot of this was recorded live off the floor. I think with just the three of them, but. I know Steph okay. is on here some. Now, if you get the Japanese version of this, which is hardly surprising, it's got more for pictures. It's got a little bit more information. 
the fact that there was there was very little information printed in here just made me more curious about it. Right. This, by the way, the version I got came out on a company called Fuel Records. Never heard of it. Never will again. Um, and the photo. We should talk about the photo. This this photo Jimmy DeGrasso found in a photo archive. So it was like stock photos that you could use. And this was a parade that these two kids. It was loud. They were covering their ears. You can tell it was the seventies because the way the kids are dressed and also that right charger in the background yep, there, that's but, right and you know it's called musically incorrect because they said yeah we're, we're not we're not making the kind of music that's popular but we don't care and i love them so much for it that they Me didn't too. that they didn't do a shadow life or they didn't they didn't go yeah. they didn't do a belly to belly i'm so glad they stayed y and t but you're right that was just enough of that angst to light a fire on me but it's not all doom and gloom. The second track, Fly Away, to me is just a really fun, um, almost like a late 60s throwback. What do you think of this one? Okay, in the book, I, you had asked me, just, here, so here's some Hendrix in here, and I thought it was more Robert Drower. Yes, that's right, yeah. You um, and he, the, and this it just, the, this yeah. is like so Drower with that, that's, that's, that wah-wah guitar sound and, and that, that slashing sound he gets with his guitar. But it has a slow burn of an opener, and then Dave just on fi- just, just on fire on this song. It's a great track, um, very mem- very memorable. I mean, it's it's not something that's going to get played on the radio. It's it's just too heavy. It's got too much fire. It's just what it is. But you were mentioning Hendrixisms, references to Jimi Hendrix. After I said my we did the interview for the book. I'm thinking you listen to the second verse. This is house burning down from electric Ladyland, with Jimi Hendrix experience that has that. It's that same groove. And then I mentioned, I believe I mentioned this in a book. Dave starts recalling third stone from the sun and that solo before it takes that breakdown again. But again, we got another seven minute song. But it's played so well. There's so much energy on this that it just kicks your ass. It is a excellent track, and there is a lot of what do you hear? What you do hear here that's similar to grunge? A lot of soft to loud. Oh yeah, but not yeah, the traditional way they would do it in grunge. Not the way the Pixies were doing it before grunge. Um, right. So you, but you do have. A lot of drama on here with the soft to loud, but they're doing it in a different way than what was all over the airwaves in '95. Yeah, and what I like about it is, is Dave didn't alter his vocal approach. He's singing energetically, and he's sounding as good as he ever did. Uh, maybe a little bit grittier, deeper. But, you know, he's not deeper. Like, you know, it's it's five years later mm-hmm. after ten, and they this band had gone through a lot in this time. I mean, they'd lost a major label deal. And the fact that they're still doing it, I just admire them so much for just pushing and just, you know, uh, persevering and and getting back out there. Yeah, we're two we're two songs into the album and fourteen minutes have elapsed. I mean, they're not; these are not. There are no commercial considerations here. Right. Um, probably the closest that they would come to sounding like heavy, you know, like Allison Chains or Band- Soundgarden would be Quicksand. Yeah, when I listen to. This- lyric i wrote down it sounds like corrosion or conformity or helmet with okay yeah. yeah yeah they sound like they sound a little like that but it has this swing and this swing to it great pre-chorus um it's very um dark and disturbing and it talks about something you may be going through in your head i feel like i'm sinking in quicksand because it's like the walls are surrounding you and you feel like there's not gonna this is going to be the end but the music behind it matches the mood of the song perfectly it sounds like in the end of the song when dave's doing those ad-libs it's almost like he's speaking in tongues and i love it and i think it just adds to that song it's just so wicked but it's it's unlike anything that they did before. It is pretty unique in the catalog. Um, mm-hmm. And when I talked to Jeff Keir, 
um, for the book as well, who was their webmaster for many years and, and has known the guys for years. Um, he said Dave was listening to a lot of like Indian music. Mm -hmm. He really wanted to incorporate the. Mm -hmm. So it's got that Eastern modality like Zeppelin would do. Sometimes, right. And you can really hear that. And uh, I think the end of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's backwards or it's just Dave is just kind of like chanting. I, I'm not sure, mm. but it, it works. It fits the song again. 546. You know, it's almost six minutes long. And uh, of course, we are into the CD age, but it's not packed to the brim. It's only a 12 song album. OK, <laughs> next up. Gold Day in Hell. I talk a lot about this in in, in the book. Um, musically, I think this song is fantastic and more mm -hmm. traditional sounding Y&T. What I did a double take at with the lyrics. What were your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Um, yeah. Very melodic and very raunchy. Um, yeah. You know, it's something that I wouldn't have blinked an eye at when I was younger. But when I listen to this now, I'm like, oh, boy, he's uh, yeah, throwing every entendre possible in here. Um, and it's yeah, it, it's a it's a dirty ass song, but yeah. again, it's got a lot of bite. It's very melodic. It's played very well with a lot of yeah. conviction. Um, I know it's quiet in the first part of verse, and yeah. then gets louder during, <laughs> then louder when they get back into the song. Great solo here from Dave again. Good pre-chorus. It's a cool track. If you could get past that, if you get past the well, <laughs> the lyric, I, I remember thinking that, you know, the lyrics of these lyrics would make David Coverdale blush. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but but it, it, it sounds like because, you know, three tracks in, I like the album and I'm digging it. But I'm thinking, man, this is heavy for them. This is different for them. When oh, this yes. comes on, I'm like, this sounds like a Y&T song. And there is something about the lyrics and, you know, not of us are prudes, but when you hear it's like when you listen to Monster by Kiss and you hear a song like Take Me Down Below and you're like, guys, yeah, come on. When did you write this? When, when did you write these lyrics when you were 14? Right. Like, it's kind of like even that. more offensive because they were 20 years old. They're that much older. Yeah, that, yeah, that they were, exactly. that he wasn't I don't, I mean, obviously I don't <laughs> feel like this was meant to be taken seriously. It's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think a, a song that was written to be taken seriously is I've Got My Own. Nice acapella opening here. And then yeah. it just gets wicked. Wow. Very personal lyric here. Yeah. Very personal. Great chorus, though, even though that lyric is so personal. Ed, <laughs> Dave pulls no punches lyrically on this song yeah. at all. But this song riffs again. Uh, it made just skills. You got a nice cool breakdown again. You got that news report and the siren going on. Added. But 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 what, when Dave comes in on that solo, blistering, and it's like yes, oh. and, and, no and question. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I've missed these guys. I had no, I didn't. Yeah, I knew I missed them. I didn't know how much until I hear them again. Exactly. Oh yeah, but another kick-ass track. This is so good. Really, yeah. really, and this is fat. This is a great fast song by it's them. Fast. It's, yeah, it's fa very and fast. It's only but... 426 and it seems longer, like it seems more of an epic track, but it is so fast. It's got a great riff. Dave's playing those. This was kind of a 90s thing too. We're playing those octaves. Yes. Where he's just where he's like muting out the 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 third. Wow, mm -hmm. So he's just playing the low and high note. It works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we get what I what I can best describe as the musical equivalent of a speed bump because whoa, was not expecting this. <laughs> nowhere land phil trying to do a beatles thing um i've said in the book that i don't think phil is a good lead singer he's a great backing singer he's a great bassist and a great songwriter but it sound it has this feel like across the universe by the beatles now i'm not saying it's a cop it, it's like a rewrite of right. that. Right. It, it's, it like, it's like field. a pastiche. It's like a Beatles pastiche. Yes. But it's very well played. Um, not one of my favorite songs on the album, but again, it's very well done. The musical bridge in it is a little heavier than the rest of the song, so it has that again. So it still has that sense of heaviness that you had on the first five tracks. So it's yeah, it's different. Um not again, like not one of my favorites, but I do appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. 
it it's interesting it doesn't really fit the album right and i'm kind of surprised that it didn't end up on one of the unearthed um mm -hmm. for that very reason but hey i wasn't wasn't about to be picky after waiting you know six years for new yt which i never thought i'd ever hear um yeah i wasn't gonna i was just gonna you know it, it did provide a bit of a breather because up until then it's been pretty you know punchy in the face musically mm -hmm. Right. Um, next up, I think we have another really traditional uh, sounding YT song with Pretty Prison. Well, a riff. Yeah. This riff is great. This chorus is great. Very well done. This is just a good mid paced rocker here. Uh, you do have the quiet beginning and the breakdown with that slow burn in yeah. the middle with Dave Solo kicks in. And then at the end of the song, they play in a higher key. Yeah, that it goes last, up. It goes up a key. Yeah, it yeah. goes up a key in that in that last chorus, and then at the end when they just go into that dun 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 dun, dun riff. Yeah, and then you hear Jimmy throwing in some cool fills <laughs> there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then it just ends right on the riff. That's a nice ending. Awesome. This is one of my favorite tracks. I mean, those first five are great, but this is a little more akin to their earlier work. It's very melodic. It has a great chorus and a great riff. They're really catchy and it works. Dave's vocal, the you know, the, uh, like in the middle of it, when it's doing mm -hmm. that da, da, dance, da, yes. Da. Um, it reminds me of, um, it, lyrically and musically, it kind of reminds me of Lonely Side of Town because it's basically, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like the songs, not all that it seems to be about you know mm -hmm. the, the price of fame or being well known um and then it lightens up again for don't know what to do which is essentially just a blues song reminds me a little bit of early government mule um it has that kind of like boogie blues kind of thing there crazy hints at this oh i'm sorry girl crazy hints at this a little bit yeah and, yep. and you have that same thing here it's decent it's not one of my favorite tracks on the album but it does have something it adds a little more to the palette on the album and it's something yeah. different and it's cool yeah as far and as I, I think i think it sounds like something that dave would have done on either of his his solo albums which were I right, mean, on the blue side singing, they're 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 pretty good um i don't listen to them as much as yt but with dave singing they can't help but sound like YT, but this is kind of a gateway towards that sort of thing. But yeah, it, you know, um, mm -hmm. musically it doesn't fit, but lyrically it does. Don't know what to do. There's a lot of don't know what to do on here. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And then next, 21st century. That riff, it sounds a little like Zero to Hero by <laughs> Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or Her Black Wings by, by Danzig. By Danzig, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has that has that riff on there but yet those guitars they really they lock in they sound so good um nice lyric great chorus on here again again a more personal lyric and more of a song about perseverance you know it's it's about a song about moving forward yeah you know this is very good we can make it better than we used to be in our time yeah you know don't look back move forward yeah. they're thinking they're thinking about themselves here this yeah. is a new beginning after all we did all we did all this work for a and m and geffen and we did what they asked and they didn't have our backs clean slate this is we're gonna move forward now with this sound and this is who we are. That's what they're saying in 21st century. Yeah, that's really, really good. It's it's one of my favorites on the album. And I like how it's one of the heavier ones in the album, but I like how they back off for the verses. There's the, there's that sense of dynamics again that, yeah. that they're so good at. Um, like I said, like you might listen to this as a new fan and think, yeah, boy, this doesn't sound like, but they're in there. The band's in there and, and their trademarks, what they do really well are in there. Absolutely. And next up, we have um, not the first time they did it, but I think the first time they did it on an album, they they remake themselves with "I'm Lost," a track from "Struck Down," and I think this is the superior version. 
It is. Well, number one, David really found his voice by this point, yeah. and he hadn't found it in 78. Um, again, the band. Consider who he's with now and who he was with then. Yeah, you had the original guys. But, you know, those guys hadn't hit their peak. Like, when they were with Joey and they were with Leonard, they hadn't hit their musical peak either. They had chops, but, you know, they were going to get better as songwriters and musicians as time went on. Here, you're when you're hearing it here with Jimmy and Steph, it just kills. Um, excellent. Excellent track. Um, and I'm glad they redid this because it, it sounded a little incomplete on yeah. Struck Down. Here, it really works. And the great thing about it is that if you didn't look at this credit that says, you know, uh, all songs 1995, Mean Street Music, except I'm Lost with a copyright of 1976, and right. looked in the songwriting credits and seen that Leonard was, was credited, you would, if you didn't know, you wouldn't have thought this was an old song. Because it fits thematically, musically, it fits the album. I mean, it does. don't know what to do. I'm lost. Confusion. Mm -hmm. Long way down. Like it, it yes. just it, it fits. It it and um I'm I'm glad that they redid it. It's cool to have this updated, super octane version of the song. You know, nothing against Joey and Leonard, but it rescues right. from that core production that was on Struck Down. And yeah, the band just sounds revitalized. It's not they didn't do anything with the arrangement. They just, it's just, a, it just sounds more complete. Exactly. And then, we, and then we have, um, I think we have the shortest song on the album at 306 confusion. Heavy. Yeah. Menacing. Yeah. What a riff. Another, another great groove laid down by the band. Yeah. Jimmy throwing in those great fills again. This is so cool. Um, it does. If it's, as you were saying, it fits the mood of the album as far as the lyrics and the music. It's a very cool track, very heavy. Again, you listen to this, you're like, Y and T, but it is Y and T. It's just them going, they're adding more to their palette again. They're going in a heavier, darker direction, and it works. Is this the one that ends with uh, those forget the past, doomed to repeat it? That's it, which I think is Phil. I think that sounds like Phil saying it, but. Mm -hmm. They're doing just so many neat little things on here, too. Yes. Um, this is, a, you know, the, there was some thought put behind this. This isn't just a bunch of jams thrown together. This was sequenced well. And uh, yes. although I will get into the sequencing in a little bit with the vinyl. Um, and then finally, we have probably the highlight of the album with no regrets. When I listen to the lyrics here, I wonder if what's going through Dave's head is, is this the last song I'm going to write with this band? Yeah, because it has this sense of melancholy about it. Yeah, um, it's because, like I said, it sounded like a new beginning, but then at the end, he's saying, "Is this it? Is this our next, our last shot? We're given one more shot. We're on indie label now. Um, will this be the last album we ever make?" And that's the feel that I get into when i hear this lyric and i hear dave's performance on it it is a great ballad again it's not but it has that sets now melancholy it's not um it doesn't play like this time right or it doesn't play like i believe in you right it's a different feel superb ending superb track yeah to end this song end this album it, it's a lot like it, it reminded me a lot. It always has of Hands of Time from Down for the yes. Count. That was the end of their AM era, and I think they knew it. Mm -hmm. I think they knew it. So, but this, of course, is more stripped down, but it's mm -hmm. it's not a happy, it's not a love ballad by any stretch. Right. It's, it's a very honest and stark um, song about life that yes. I think anybody who's had to make a major change has had to has had to get over that fear and say, I've made a decision, good or bad, this is what it is, no regrets. Like, um, And uh, it just left me thinking, I wasn't thinking this was, this was going to be it. I was actually thinking that this was a new beginning, which it was, um, as far as recorded work. Of course, it's a little bit thin, but um, I was so glad to have them back. I do want to talk about a couple other things. And one thing I didn't know existed at the time was a cassette. 
of Musically Incorrect. This is a UK version on Music for Nations. Uh, okay. Now, my Endangered Species CD is on Music for Nations, but this is uh, this is the UK cassette of it. Um, okay. And it doesn't have it doesn't have much in it. Um, actually, there's there's actually a few more thank yous in this that there okay. are in the CD, but uh, and then a just a few years ago, a company called Night of the Night of the Vinyl Dead started reissuing albums that were never on vinyl that were on these smaller labels, and they they put this out, which I've kind oh, I kind of had, had to get. This is this is number sixty seven out of five hundred. Um, oh, nice! But they uh, they kind of butchered the song. Oh yeah. Look at that. So, We're I'll just fly away. <laughs> Long way down. Quicksand. Cold day in hell. I've got my own. Nowhere land. Pretty prison. No regrets. 21st century. Don't know what to do. I'm lost. Confusion and fly away. Okay. Mm -hmm. The rest of it, whatever. You should never close this album with anything other than no regrets. 100% true. <laughs> but what I like about this company, and this is not the last time we'll see this, but they make the, the the labels of the records themselves look like a label that the band was on. So this is made to look like an old London Ooh, label. Oh, nice. But instead of London, it says N-O-T-V-D, Night of the Vinyl Dead. Right. Sweet. So yeah, there's quite, there's quite a bit of detail gone into this. And I don't know how, I don't know if there's any copies available, but I got mine off of Discogs. But yeah, Musically Incorrect, Y&T were back and... Uh, it was just, you know, I didn't, it's, it's hearing something you didn't think you'd ever hear. It was, uh, it was a really, really exciting moment. And best of all, I was not disappointed. I'm glad it wasn't a rehash of older, you know, you know, I, and I'm, we'll get to this. I like Face Melter. I'm glad they didn't put out Face Melter as their next album. I'm glad they did something different. Me too. Yeah. Me, me too. They, again, they added, they, they were going through a dark period in their careers at this point and that came out on this album they added to their musical palette on here and they made is when well, i think is one of their best i mean at this point listen to this so much like i i know i've been saying i wrote i said in the book in your book 81 84 albums they're my they're my favorites i might put this over black tiger now even though black tiger had more hooks. I think overall this is more consistent. Yeah. I, I think it's and I think it's better recorded too. And one more thing I want to mention here. Um I didn't buy this album in 95. I was listening to a lot of different bands at this point. I was listening to Chris Whitley, who his music I adore, Radiohead, Oasis. Foo Fighters, bands like that. But if I, if you go back to 1995 and you look at the bands who had peaked in the 70s or 80s that are hard with a hard rock sound, if you look at what was out there, what they were putting out at this time, I think this pretty much crushes what those bands were doing. Like Van Halen, Balance. I don't, I don't think this compares to this album. I'm looking. I'm looking at extreme. Waiting for the punchline. Um, slaughter. Fear no evil. Dawkins. Dysfunctional. Now, I'm not saying these albums aren't good, but I think this album by Y&T, I think, is much stronger. Wasp. Still not black enough. Black Sabbath. Forbidden. Bon Jovi. These days. ACDC. Ball Breaker. Iron Maiden. Next Factor. I'm going a little bit metal here too. Uh, Ozzy. Osborne. Osmosis. Dangerous Toys. Artists formerly known as Dangerous Toys. Skid Road, Subhuman Race. That album, I would probably put alongside Musically Incorrect by Y&T is probably the best albums that came out at this time while hard rock was not getting a lot of love. Oh, it was in the nadir of popularity, for sure. Right. The, yeah, certainly. This but, is a band, this is an album with, by a band that had something to prove and their hearts yes. are on their sleeves all over this album. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's one of the best of its era by a band of their era, for sure. No doubt. And it's an album that needs to be revisited. If you've only known them for their 80s albums, up or even up through 10 from 1990, yeah. Definitely pick the check this out. Musically incorrect. The one that I have.
this is a twofer that I don't know if it's still on the YNT website, but I did buy this from the band themselves. Yeah, so and I don't think it's there anymore, but okay. yeah. And then yeah. Dangerous Species is the next album we'll be discussing. Spoiler alert. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so, um, but that's on here as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check them out. And if, if you know, if you're new to the band, there's a quick way to find out exactly what they did and when they did it and what we think of it. Exactly. Myself and John and several others. Uh, I'll have the link to this below. Um, John, thanks once again. And this was really you're great going for this album because it just brought back the memories of, of getting this new and, and being so glad that they're back. And uh, they um, followed this up pretty quickly with another album, which is what we're going to talk about next. So, John, thanks again for sitting Thank in. You. Thanks, everybody, for watching this edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions. We'll see you later.